Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the virtual Fleet Week of Fleet Europe. My name is Steven Schoofs. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Fleet Europe, but I'm not going to be the moderator nor the presenter of today's webinar. The webinar that we will have is in line with all other webinars. It's an informative webinar and the information given is based on information shared by our partners and by the editorial team and so reproduction is only admitted when you inform us beforehand, of course. The webinar today is sponsored by Atlon. Atlon International is one of the leading leasing companies and is also since years at the forefront of fleet electrification. Now, this webinar is the second in a series that we have this week. You can see it on the screen. It's the second one that we are organizing. Yesterday, we saw that the offering of electric vehicles is increasing. And we are also happy that the appetite from international fleet customers is steadily increasing. Now, one of the questions those fleet managers have is, of course, related to the cost efficiency, and that will be the topic of today. Tomorrow, we will talk about the charging infrastructure. On Thursday, we will deep dive into innovative solutions, and we will end this fleet week with a case study from SAP around implementation of electric vehicles. But with no further ado, Let's start with today's webinar about the cost efficiency of electric vehicles. And I would like to introduce the moderator of today's webinar, Mr. Tor Konings. And he is the International Account Director at Atlon International. If everything is fine, then now Tor Konings should have the speaking rights. And so he can start moderating this exciting webinar of the Fleet Week. We'll do our best, uh, Stephen. Thank you so much. Uh, and <laughs> welcome to you all on behalf of the entire Atlon International team into this deep dive uh, on the TCO of electric uh, cars as part of the virtual fleet week uh, for your electric eyes only, so to say. Let us uh, start with a quick introduction round uh, first. My name is Tor Koenings. I am one of the international account directors for Atlon International, and I bring 25 years of experience in the international uh, leasing and mobility industry. I've been working with large international customers on uh, service optimization, on TCO reduction, and on the consultancy on European car policies, for instance, in the electrification journey. Peter, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yes, Thor, uh, thank you. Uh, Peter Gossens, also working for uh, Atlon International. I've been in automotive a little bit less long, but I'm going on to my 20th year now, uh, of which the last 12 uh, in some way, shape or form uh, involved with uh, electrification and, uh, and the newer technologies. So this, this webinar is something I'm really looking for. Thank you, Martin, uh, Peter. And, uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Maarten Weyenberg. And like Tor, I'm also the uh, International Account Director of uh, Atlon International. Started my career some 25 years ago in the automotive industry, uh, mostly working in the uh, leasing and fleet uh, se sector, um, both international and local, basically helping customer relationships uh, move forward. Um, and today I'm looking forward to having this session uh, together with you. So uh, let's get it on. Wonderful, thank you. Together, the three of us, we are very much looking forward to share our experience with you on this topic. So let's get started. Let me start with uh, three questions. Why is it important for you to understand the TCO, the total cost of ownership of an electric car? What are the most important building blocks of that TCO? And how can these insights help you in your further decision making? By the end of this session, you will have a better understanding in the TCO building blocks, as we call it. You will also know how to 
use your electric vehicles correctly. You will understand the importance of charging profiles. And of course, we will share our best tips and tricks with you. For the avoidance of doubt, I would like to scope um, uh, our, our session this afternoon. When we talk TCO, we talk about all the predicted costs around electric vehicles. This includes energy costs. It also includes taxes. And we would like to separate this from other abbreviations in our industry. For instance, TCU, total cost of use. For instance, two identical cars with two different driver profiles, they can have end up with a totally different cost of use. Uh, we will not consider that in this deep dive session. And also TCM is a well-known abbreviation, stands for total cost of mobility. That has a lot wider scope, including alternative mobility solutions, car sharing, uh, public transport, uh, electric bikes, electric scooters, etc. This is not what this is all about. We talk about, uh, on the next slide you can see that, our session today is anything with a plug, any car with a plug, so BEVs and PHEVs. Two more abbreviations that we would like to clarify at the beginning. BEV stands for a battery electric vehicle. That is a car basically with only one engine, an electric engine. If you don't charge that car, it won't run. Very simple. The PHEV, the plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, has two engines. The electric one and the traditional combustion engine that can be a petrol or a diesel engine. Of course, you need to charge that car as well. And if you don't charge that, the cost consequences will be significant as we will come at a later stage. Um, so this is the scope, uh, what we uh, would like to clarify first. If you would like to get further insights in the TCU in total cost of use, uh, we can uh, recommend you to participate in the session on Thursday where new innovations, new technologies are being uh, facilitated by Octo. Right, so Martin, with all this in mind, let's have a look at the building blocks of the TCO. Can you do us a favor and run us through that, please? Yeah, sure, Tor, I can, I can manage that uh, for you. Uh, well, Tor, looking at the TCO components, they are basically the same as uh, as traditional vehicles uh, like petrol like diesel also electric or plug-in hybrids require things like financing maintenance repair tires fuel insurance and in the end you hope to get the best residual value uh, as possible uh, of course um, nonetheless i would like to make a couple of distinctions when looking at electric cars and plug-in hybrids for instance taking a look at the investment value of a electric car and plug-in hybrid um, that's, to be very fair, uh, it's more expensive than or higher compared to a traditional uh, combustion engine. Now, it's, it's, it's always dangerous to, to put a number on it, but uh, um, if, you have, if you really push me, on average, we see a difference of uh, sometimes around 3,000 euros uh, for difference compared to a traditional uh, car. Um, what we also see is that uh, rebates may vary widely uh, across Europe. This is mainly triggered by um, yeah, things like the EU regulations on, on CO2 emissions and also the, uh, the incentives uh, provided on, on local level. Um, and this creates either a push or a pull in, uh, in the separate European uh, markets. Also residual value, uh, considering the young age or the relatively young age of uh, electric vehicles, uh, the whole sector is basically struggling with, uh, with setting residual values. But on the other hand, we also see that the, uh, the, the market is uh, maturing very fast, so that is also improving uh, very fast, uh, at a very fast rate. So talking about maintenance, uh, yes, electric vehicle requires less maintenance compared to the traditional car. It has less components, so as a result, you have less maintenance. But on the other hand, and I may I say also a little bit unfortunate, uh, requires more replacement of tires, so that's a little bit higher than, uh, than normal or uh, compared to combustion engines. The tire wear is mainly caused by the simple fact that electric cars and plug-in hybrids weigh more. 
Uh, this is as a result of the, uh, the batteries, uh, they are very heavy. Uh, but also electric vehicles provide instant torque wearing tires more easily. So hopefully that clarifies the, um, the higher tire cost. Now plug-in hybrids is a little bit different story because uh, maintenance and tire usage depends a little bit on the partition uh, between uh, the electric uh, powertrain and combustion powertrain of a hybrid vehicle uh, and the usage. So that's a little bit uh, different, uh, different story. Um, fuel, oh, fuel. We don't really talk about fuel if we talk about electric cars. So it's more about energy uh, uh, cost in uh, within TCO. Uh, that's also a quite a specific topic and requires also some special attention, because in order to get the most out of your electric fleet and especially plug-in hybrid fleet, a charging infrastructure is very important. Not allowing your drivers to charge, for instance, at your office. Uh, but also at home uh, to take care of that. Now, if you are interested uh, in this topic, uh, please let me remind you that tomorrow Fleet Europe has also a webinar organized called um, the Right EV Infrastructure. So please check out the Fleet Europe website if you want to register for that webinar tomorrow. Uh, and Tor, I would like to conclude with the last, uh, last thing. It's around incentives. I think it's all around us. Governments are racing towards zero emission uh, across uh, Europe. So a lot of incentives are given away uh, in order to support low emission vehicles, so plug-in hybrids and electric vehicles. So yeah, that's something to make use of uh, when taking, uh, taking a look at your total cost of ownership. But that's what I would like to conclude with, uh, with Tor. I hope this answers your question. It does, it does, it does. Thank you very much uh, for the building blocks of the TCO. Um, yeah, uh, you concluded with the uh, various fiscal uh, taxation regimes uh, across Europe. And perhaps, Peter, you can elaborate somewhat more on the differences in the European markets? Uh, yes, uh, Tor, I, I certainly can try to, to do that. Um, as Martin mentioned, the direction of travel is, is clear. Uh, the, 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 the traditional TCO components are, are, so to speak, converging. Some are still to the disadvantage of the newer technologies and some are clearly uh, to their advantage. Some specialists uh, who are very optimistic uh, think that by 2023, we will reach what we call cost parity uh, without any fiscal support, these, these um, especially battery electric vehicles being just as expensive as the traditional powertrains. I leave that to, uh, to those experts. Uh, but the, the, clear, the clear message is that you have to compare the TCO of these vehicles. And, and basically, we see three groups of countries uh, in especially Western Europe. Uh, like I said, the direction is clear. Um, more and more electric and, and plug-in hybrid vehicles are becoming uh, cost uh, competitive. And uh, this is happening all over the place, but at a quite steady, uh, I wouldn't call it slow, but a steady uh, evolution rather than revolution. Uh, the, the exceptions there are the countries that are jumping directly to full electric and, and not evolutionary, but almost uh, instantly. And, and there, of course, we all know the example of Norway, uh, but it's also the case in, in the B2B sector uh, for the Netherlands. And they are joined uh, by the UK uh, this year with really high uh, numbers of uh, full electric vehicles. On the other hand, you have markets that are taking more of a route, especially in the company cars, uh, by the plug-in hybrids. Uh, Belgium and, and Germany clearly serve as, as an example. Not that full electric is not developing in those markets, but from what we see clearly at a slower clip than, uh, the, uh, than the plug-in hybrids. As you can see, it's not an anomaly. Uh, Sweden is, uh, has, has lines on it. That's because it's a bit the odd duck. Uh, both plug-in hybrids and e full EVs are doing well there, so it's difficult to put them in a, um, in a certain category. So the message is pay attention. While the direction is the same, the speed at which this is going in all these markets is vastly different. And on the next, next slide, we, uh, we try to illustrate that by taking the standard bearer 
of uh, volume elect electric uh, mobility, uh, the uh, a Tesla Model 3 long range, and, and we tried to select a, a vehicle that was very uh, comparable, and we ran it through our very own TCO uh, simulator that you can find online. And um, and I, I'd say it's almost like the World Cup. It's it's very exciting, uh, but in the end, it's the Germans that win, even if it's by uh, a nose length. Um, it turns out that a Tesla Model 3 over a traditional four-year uh, cycle, 120,000 kilometers, is, is just a couple of hundred euros cheaper than in the Netherlands. And that's not really the interesting part. The interesting part is if you count everything together for, for example, the Belgian market, you have a 14,000 euro difference, which is basically the investment value of a small car. So it's, it's something that you have to keep in mind if you are wondering why your Dutch account manager can easily fit uh, a Tesla Model 3 into his budget and your sales director in, uh, in Belgium who should in a traditional world uh, be driving a bigger car usually has access to a, to a, to a bigger more premium uh, vehicle is having a, a bit more difficulty getting the same vehicle. It is, it is essentially, there are some other reasons, but it is, is essentially down to subsidies and, uh, and taxes. That's clear, um, at least to me it's clear. Uh, when we talk uh, about the fiscal uh, impact, uh, it, it is clear for the companies how significant that impact is. Martin, what can you tell us of the fiscal impact for drivers? Well, uh, after looking at the total cost uh, of ownership uh, as, uh, as presented by Peter in the previous slide, uh, I, I guess it's very tempting for all those German fleet managers to change all their drivers to a Tesla Model uh, Model S. Uh, very tempting, of course. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, that's not the total story because there's also something like a fiscal incentive for, for drivers. Now, taking a look at the slide that we just uh, put on screen for you, um, I just want to highlight it is, again, very dangerous to make a comparison between vehicles and trim levels. Uh, but nonetheless, it, it shows you uh, a little bit of, of the imbalance that we see, for instance, in this case, uh, in, in Germany. So on the left side, you see a car uh, which from a total cost of ownership, basically you would, you would go for an electric vehicle. Eh? On the, you see in the middle 501 euro per month difference only for total cost of ownership. So basically that's a no brainer to, to go in the direction of electric vehicle. However, taking a look from the driver perspective, uh, the mere 13 euro difference uh, per month for the driver is hardly an incentive to change their mind and go for a full electric vehicle. Um, so with, with that in mind um, and, and with all the uncertainties, a driver is tempted to do, go with what they are already used to today. And as a result, we'll have a tendency to go for plug-in hybrids. And this is exactly what we currently see in the, uh, in the German market, uh, where the number of hybrid vehicles being ordered uh, is, is, is increasing uh, dram dramatically uh, and it continues to uh, grow uh, towards the next years as well. So if we go to the next slide, here you have another example of a country. In this case, it's, it's the Netherlands. Um, here you will see that a, a market and the embracement of electric vehicles is supported by having a more balanced situation. Both the company and employee benefit big time uh, looking at the, uh, the total cost of ownership from the company side and on the other hand the employee incentive. Uh, so for a fleet manager it will be far easier uh, to, uh, to um, convince drivers to drive electric vehicles and it will be less hard work for you to convince your organization to move to, move to an electric uh, strategy. So this also partially explains the different rate of um, uh, embracing this throughout Europe as Peter already showed in the European uh, map. So back to Tora, please. Okay, so if there is, if there is one takeaway from this topic, it will be that you have to tailor your approach with the support of your partners. You have to tailor your approach to every specific European market individually in order to come to the best solution that suits your company. 
So let's talk a little bit more on PHEV first. Let's take a further deep dive into this. Peter, um, can I ask you to dive with us into the topic of PHEV? Absolutely. Uh, I, think, I think we have a lot of experience with uh, PHEVs. This is not a, a new technology. This is a technology that broke through uh, in, in several markets uh, years ago. And, and we know that it is, uh, while very interesting uh, from a technological perspective, it is also uh, dangerous, might be too, too, too heavy of a word, but, but you have to pay attention. In an ideal situation, you can provide drivers with charging infrastructure at the office and at home. And, and there we are absolutely convinced that an enormous amount of the, of the drivers that, that are in company fleets can get very, very, very nice high mileages driving purely electric. Uh, there's, there's, there, there, there's, of course, a small section of, of people who drive an enormous amount that, that will still be served better by, by other solutions. But if they can plug in very often, it is, it is absolutely a good choice. Um, when one of the two falls away, charging at the office is not possible, or you don't go into the office, which could be the case uh, in the last few months, uh, and you can only charge at home or the office, then you have to be careful as a fleet manager. Um, luckily, technology is moving very fast. If you compare the current breed of plug-in hybrids with what we had five years ago, the, the range purely electric has, has gone up tremendously. You're, you're always around 40, 45 kilometers of electric range, and there are even vehicles out there with uh, over 80, 90 kilometers of range every time you've plugged them in, so that really helps. But you have to look at every profile uh, individually. We, see, we still see very nice numbers of, of people uh, driving these vehicles um, correctly and, and with high, high, relatively high mileages purely electrically uh, by being able to plug in at the office or home. What you absolutely want to avoid is drivers taking these vehicles solely for the fiscal advantage. Basically, you're giving a car that is more expensive, as Maarten mentioned, that is heavier, that is, um, that is over-engineered, and you're driving it as a traditional vehicle. Um, if, you do, if we do a quick simulation, for example, let's take a Skoda Superb in the Belgian market, and, and we do very conservatively we compare a normal driver that can plug in the vehicle uh, part of the time and you compare that to a driver who never plugs it in, you can absolutely be guaranteed that you're always talking double the fuel cost and in a lot of cases, uh, many multiples of that. So if you want to protect your TCO, make sure, and, and that's why it's not for us, it's not TCU, it is really predictable. Uh, where people can charge is, is basically a couple of questions that you have to ask them. Uh, it is avoidable that these cars end up in the hands of the wrong, uh, of the wrong drivers and completely scuttle your, or your TCO. I hope Ooh. the warning is, uh, <laughs> is well received. <laughs> well done. Well done. Let me summarize. Let me summarize your, uh, your insights into PHEV. On this slide, you can see the most important elements for PHEV cars and for drivers. You made it uh, clear that uh, having uh, the charging infrastructure at home, whether that is in your front yard or in your street or in your direct neighborhood as a driver is, is crucially important. In addition to that, having charging facilities enough charging facilities at your office location, super important. It also requires a, a, a different mindset for the drivers. Uh, the adaptive usage of the vehicle is how we would like to, uh, to call that. And it is also, uh, it became clear that uh, this is not a one size fits all situation. It requires a very tailored approach. So this is all about PHEVs. Does the same apply, Peter, also for the battery electric vehicles, for the PEVs? Well, the good news is battery electric ve vehicles from a CO2 perspective are easier to implement. Uh, as you already mentioned, they only have one uh, fuel type on board, so you don't run the risk of, of any bi-fuel uh, vehicle. They will always emit zero grams of CO2 uh, locally. 
but as with everything in life, there's always a but. Um, regarding your TCO, you do have to be careful. And, and because we believe that, that nothing makes it more clear than a concrete example, we've taken uh, a case from France, um, a, a French driver driving, of course, a French car, uh, Peugeot 208, new electric technology, uh, great charging specs. Uh, and, and basically that driver has three three places where he can charge. He can charge at the office, and if it's a big office, it will have a very interesting uh, energy contract, and, and that's what we used to do this uh, simulation in the tool. Uh, he can charge at home, and as you correctly mentioned, at home means really privately or around the home, close to the home in the street. We, we noticed that, especially if you take into account the tax uh, influences, that the price of real private charging and close to home charging are very often in the same neighborhood. And then there is the fast developing fast charging, HPC, high power charging that is coming up across Europe with, with parties like Ionity, Fastnet, uh, Allego, and, and really all the big oil majors uh, piling in. Um, they, there you have the, the, the danger of convenience. Uh, the, the, they are well located on high density roads, and there's always something interesting to do, whether it's quickly shopping, a sandwich, uh, a coffee, exactly like you want it. Uh, there's always something interesting to do. And these vehicles only need 10, 15 minutes to, to charge half their battery. So that is, that is a, a, a location that we see, a usage that we really see uh, growing. And, and if you let loose the scenarios, the comfort scenario for the driver is simple. He can charge at home, you let him charge at the office and you give him a charge card to fast charge for vacation and and long trips that is the comfort scenario and you end up in this simulation four-year contract 120,000 kilometers you end up with around 110 euros uh, per month of, of of energy cost which is which is perfectly acceptable can you cut that cost yes of course you can make it lower you can tell this driver well we already provide you with home charging and office charging we tell you we don't give you access to fast charging that will cost cut your cost by a good 40 euros uh, per month you can go even lower you can tell this driver please i've made a huge investment at the office use your home charger as the exception um, that is clearly uh, that is that is clearly also a, a solution and then you're almost talking about a ridiculous amount of money 30 35 euros on the other hand, you might want to protect your office chargers for those people who don't have uh, home charging capacity, uh, which is perfectly good strategy, but you do have to realize that then you're back up to, uh, to normal, let's call them that, uh, energy costs per month. All those four, four scenarios are the easy ones. They're the low hanging fruit. People can charge in or near their house. What if they can't? Well, then basically you're left with only office or public. And there we really want to warn before you decide not to invest in office charging, that the difference between people charging at the office, paying you paying around 70 euros per month and people finding their way, whether it's when they go for fast food with the kids or when they go for their croissant and, and espresso in the morning and finding out if I do this two, three, four times per week, I'm done that that runs up to over 200 euros per month. And you're talking about the two extremes, you're talking about a massive amount of money uh, and impact on your TCO that runs into the thousands of euros per, per vehicle. So knowing the profiles, knowing how the vehicle, predicting how the vehicle is going to be used will really pay off uh, in the end. Cool. That's clear, uh, Peter, and thank you for sharing that um, a specific example uh, in, in France, but the same goes for, for any car in any market, the huge differences between charging costs. Uh, we hope and we trust that that is informative to the audience. Um, so let us uh, look at the most important takeaways of the battery electric vehicles. Pay attention. To your car policy and adopt very clear rules with regards to charging for instance incentivize office charging because of the lower energy cost uh, provide as many charging uh, facilities at home and avoid fast charging wherever uh, you have the opportunity to reduce this 
So thank you for that, uh, Peter. Um, a question to you, Martin. Um, having heard all this, uh, which recommendations do you have for your customers? In a nutshell, can you elaborate high level on that, please? I'll try to keep it uh, short in a nutshell, uh, Tor. So uh, at least I hope that during this webinar, we showed that the, uh, that the world is already embracing electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids. So if the audience is not considering it yet, working on it already, um, we highly recommend starting uh, as soon as possible uh, and try to electrify your fleet as soon as possible. Furthermore, with all the different uh, vehicle options out there, incentives and, and driver profiles, Bear in mind, it's not a one-size-fits-all solution. You have to take that uh, very carefully. Let's just get very close to your um, yeah, internal stakeholders, but also your business partners like leasing providers, OEM, OEMs that you uh, cooperate with. I try to ut utilize their brain power, uh, create awareness uh, within your company. Uh, and in the end, that will hopefully pay off in, uh, in an easier transition towards uh, electric uh, mobility within your company. Whatever the outcome of your decision, um, also bear in mind to, to keep on measuring the results. Uh, things change very quickly. Uh, it's, it's therefore not a single shot event uh, with, with new cars uh, being introduced almost on a weekly basis uh, with, with longer range, new incentives being, uh, uh, being introduced on the market by, by governments. It changes very, very quickly. So you need to be uh, very close uh, to uh, to the situation and adopt your strategy uh, accordingly. So uh, yeah, summarizing as the slide already says, start now, uh, make a tailored approach, do it together with your suppliers, OEM stakeholders, measure your results in order to easily adapt and keep close to the developments what is happening. That's what I can uh, summarize in a nutshell, um, for the audience. <laughs> well done, well done, Martin. Thanks Thank you. for your summary. Um, this is the part of the, the content that we uh, prepared, three of us. Um, looking at the clock, we still have uh, some time left, of course, to uh, answer your questions. For this, we, uh, we have that tool as the participants can enter you can enter your questions uh, using the chat function and i can see <laughs> i can see the first question uh, coming in martin i'm going to give that to you the question is what kind of car are you driving you're on mute <laughs> Yeah, that's not a real without reason, no, Tor. But I'm on, on mute now. Now, good question. Uh, yeah, well, um, working in the automotive industry, I learned not to mention any brand name, so I will just stay away from uh, from that. Um, but to, to be very fair and honest, I'm driving an in traditional combustion engine uh, today. But as it happens to be, I'm almost in the position to order a new car, and that will definitely be either an electric vehicle or a hybrid vehicle um and um yeah to be very honest our company also embraces the new uh, uh the new normal we're talking often about the new normal but this is also about the new normal and it's mandatory within our company to choose uh, either hybrid or uh, uh, a electric vehicle so um, i hope that answers the question and any suggestions are welcome uh, okay thanks for your honesty and for the uh for the positive outlook moving forward yeah yeah it's very nice <laughs> uh, next question, um, Peter. Perhaps you can pick that one up. Uh, this is around the availability, the availability of enough models in the, I would reckon, the higher segment, mid segment, small segment, the production of new uh, vehicle launches, EV vehicle launches worldwide. Can you elaborate uh, further on that question, please? I think, yeah, absolutely. I think it's a very important one and it's one that's been holding fleet managers back uh, for a while. Uh, if, if, if you divide it into segments, and I'm going to maybe be a little bit aggressive here, but in the upper segment, there is almost no reason not to drive fully electric. 
there's really a lot of uh, a lot of vehicles out there, a lot of brands out there. They can pull caravans and, and boats if you want. Uh, there's seven seaters. There's there's something for for everyone. Uh, as you drop down into the market, uh, it, it becomes a little bit more difficult. Um, we we still don't have uh, big sedans, uh, for example, that are fully electric. So you have to be you have to be careful. It might pay to lengthen contracts a little bit because there's really, uh, like Martin said, a huge amount of, of, of vehicles coming. There's there's literally days when there are two announcements of factories starting up uh, production of. Uh, of, of electric uh, of electric uh, vehicles, um, so so it might pay to to just slow down a bit if if the contract terms uh, allow it. For the smaller, and then I mean especially, I don't really mean smaller because there are very nice small electric vehicles uh, out there, but they are still quite expensive. So for the for the for the least expensive segments of the market. I would advise, and I expect that you will need to uh, renew your fleet uh, still with the tra traditional petrol, diesel, or hybrid powertrains for uh, for a couple of years before there are really competitive, um, competitive TCO-wise competitive uh, options out there. Cool. Thank you. I see a question coming in, and this is uh, touches upon the wear of tires, the extra wear of tires. The question is, do you within Atlon have good analysis on tire consumption between traditional vehicles and electric vehicles? I guess I'll take that one. Please. Okay. Um, if you would be so kind. <laughs> thank you. Um, do we have good, uh, do we have good data? Uh, yes and no. Uh, we have good data for uh, electric vehicles. We have uh, a lot of them in, in fleet already, so we can compare, but we also realize we have to be careful. Uh, electric vehicles uh, traditionally that we have in fleet um, have been of the more expensive, powerful, heavy uh, uh, type, so the upper segment uh, of the market. Uh, and uh, the technology is evolving so it would be dangerous to take a, a tesla model s from 2012 and say okay this is the new tire uh, consumption but we are getting more and more view on um on on the tires uh, while while consumption it might be under control the absolute truth is that these are heavy vehicles tire sizes are bigger so so the cost of the tires that are on these vehicles and that's probably not going away very fast uh, even if they can put down the power uh, better than than in the past uh, the, the the tire in itself will be more expensive for quite a while to come okay for all the participants because i see many questions uh, coming in so thank you very much for that it it, it it demonstrates that it is a topic that raises a lot of questions uh we will answer all these questions also separately of course you will get an answer to all of them so if for whatever reason your question does not uh, uh is not being discussed today we will come back uh, on that uh shortly I see your question coming in on, on range anxiety. How do you get drivers, Martin, maybe you can pick that one up. How do you get drivers to go over the range anxiety, especially for long trips slash vacations? What solutions can you offer them? Martin. Hello. Yes, uh, Tor. Um, yeah, of course. It's, it's that's always something very personal for for drivers. What uh, what they find uh, anxiety or not. Uh, um, it depends on the profile. How often they are going to use the uh, the car and what circumstances. How far do they travel with the car? But once you get that profile set, uh, it, I think that's a good basis to to discuss with your driver if uh, if the electric vehicle is is good enough. Yes or no. But for those people that still have doubt about the fact that uh, is this sufficient for me in an electric car, uh, there's always the comfortable feeling of going back to a plug-in hybrid, which also provides lower emission, also provides some of the advantages of electric cars. Um, so there's there's yeah basically two answers uh, story uh, to that. Uh, range anxiety, electric cars, uh, discuss it, see if you can take it away by looking at their profile. And if it doesn't uh, provide any solution, 
yeah, go for the plug-in hybrid and uh, if that makes you feel more comfortable as a first uh, first step by the way range is uh, is it's is getting longer and longer with every new car being introduced so in in turn that will also disappear uh, towards the background is my uh, my expectation sure. okay thank you um Maybe you can also pick up the next uh, question around the uh, uh, the cost for the charging facility, the charging the station, the, the the system, the infrastructure. Whether those these costs are included in the budget or separated from the budget of the lease driver. What is your experience on that, uh, Maarten? Uh, whether uh, charging facilities are included in budget. Well, uh, looking at the customers that I look after, uh, most of them will include the charging facility for home use in the, in the budget. Um, on the other hand, charging facilities at the, at the office, for instance, that's often covered by the company itself. So that's the, that's the typical uh, uh, picture we see, uh, we see on the market or I see in the market. Maybe you can share also some of your experience or ideas, Um What? Yeah. In addition to uh, in addition to what you're saying, uh, I do recognize that uh, it is included. The charging infrastructure is included in the budget. What I see more and more uh, is that um, companies are um, spreading the cost of the the significant cost of the infrastructure over a longer period of time um, because. Uh, changing into uh, a plug-in or a full electric uh, vehicle um, what we see is that it is a change that is going to last the next car will also be an electric car you you, you hardly go back yeah, true you make that switch you change the mindset and then it is ev moving forward so why would you have to um, uh, invest and depreciate those high costs of the infrastructure on the first car only. So I can, in, maybe in addition to your question, yes, included, but over a longer period of time. Yeah. Um, do we have time for some more questions? Yes, I see. <laughs> Wonderful. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Uh, okay. you think everybody thinks our tour is being selective he ignores all the questions that he doesn't like that he doesn't answer no, but I, I found an, another one what possible positive changes can occur from drivers by moving from combustion to electric what possible positive changes can occur from drivers by moving from combustion to electric people <laughs> i see you smile <laughs> peter is that a, a sort of a signal that you would like to pick that up no. <laughs> no, 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 I, I, I'm willing to answer it from, from, from my Please. personal uh, personal view, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think split it up. Uh, you, you have drivers who, who, who really, um, in, in the end, money counts. Uh, and there's a lot of countries out there where, of course, your, your electric car will end, will end up impacting your net paycheck. Uh, so that's the, that's the short, easy uh, answer. Um, there is there is also the fact that in my personal opinion it's just a smoother smoother ride it, it is it is it is very fun to drive an electric uh, an electric vehicle with that torque with that silence uh, with uh, with the ease with which it's uh, drives by the way no more manual no more gear shift uh, it's, it's always an automatic um, but but I, I think the the overarching almost philosophical um, answer in these in these times of, of global warming is is maybe that it makes you feel good <laughs> that that this is a way of um, of avoiding uh, co2 emissions and if we can then clean up uh, preferably fast the uh, the energy production as well then then this this will really be a long-term viable solution to stay mobile without uh, without burning fossil fuels that went into the ground millions of years ago Thanks, Peter. Um, next question coming in is around, um, can you list the countries 
where a battery electric vehicle TCO is already at parity or lower than an ICE car, a uh, traditional petrol or diesel car. The, the, the person asking this question is assuming Norway, but there are likely uh, to be uh, uh, other countries as well. Um, you took us through the European map, Peter. Uh, are there more countries well, besides Norway well, where first, the uh, total cost is uh, coming to a tipping point or at the same level? Well, let me first make the distinction between the investment values of the vehicle. If, if, if you're asking in general, you really have to pay attention because, because in the end, electric vehicles are, are still uh, quite a bit more expensive and you will not quickly find them uh, in the 10 to 15,000 euro range uh, yet. They're coming, but, but so that's, that's a distinction to make. Um, on, the, uh, on the other hand, and it's dangerous because I'm definitely sure that I'm going to forget some. As you go from the north to the south, the Scandinavia, uh, it's, it's, looking, it's looking very good. You have to look at the, um, at the TCO, make the individual calculations. The Netherlands is a traditional one. Uh, the UK, absolutely, with, with now you know, zero benefiting kind on, on EVs, it, it, <laughs> it will... It will it will influence uh, the decisions of drivers. Uh, Germany, as we as we showed, is looking good, but then also for plug-in hybrids. So so there you have to you have to expect a little bit of heartache uh, for the driver to to choose. France is providing heavy incentives, but from my knowledge, is quite a small car, uh, smaller car market. So so as said, it also depends on the market. And then if you if you head further south, when we're talking uh, in, in, in Europe, uh, we see the pickup rates uh, slowing down a bit. Uh, has to do with purchasing power, uh, has to do with, with the incentives that might not be high enough to convince a huge uh, amount of people. The best thing I can, I can ask you is reach out to your partners, do the calculations, uh, for the individual, uh, for the individual markets, and I am very sorry if I forgot anyone. <laughs> sorry, it's also a good uh, moment to mention the TCO simulator within the Atlon yeah, uh, so as a parent, good tool to help you identify the best total cost of ownership between uh, electric, petrol, or diesel cars or hybrids. Check it out was the uh, indeed. Uh, it, it was indeed also a question coming in. Uh, with appreciation for the presentation. So happy to share that uh, afterwards with you guys. Can you introduce us shortly about the TCO tool you mentioned in your presentation? How can we find it on the internet? Well, we are going to make sure that uh, all participants will receive a copy of this uh, presentation, including the link to the Atlon TCO simulator. Um, time flies. Unfortunately, we have to close our session. I would like to thank you, Martin, and you, Peter. Uh, and the supporting teams of Atlon and Nexus Communication. Uh, we hope that this deep dive was informative to all of you and uh, that will help you on your electrification journey. Uh, it was a pleasure for us. We would like to thank you. And I would like to hand back to Stephen Schroefs, who I see in my screen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Toch. Thank you, Martin, and thank you, Peter. Um, as mentioned by Tor, we received plenty of questions. So thank you very much for the engagement of the participants. Um, I would like just to ask each of these panelists one more question with a short answer. They are not prepared, so this makes it as spontaneous <laughs> as possible to close this webinar. Um, the first one, is for Peter. Peter, you mentioned in your presentation that based on the calculations that probably the best mix to charge is if you can convince your drivers to use home charging and office charging. How, what are some kind of, let's say, levers, uh, arguments to make sure that as an organization you can put in place the right infrastructure because you then also need to make sure that in terms of payroll, et cetera, that everything is settled. Do you have any tips? How do you make sure that uh, that home office charging 
is also accepted within the company and with the drivers. Okay, indeed a, uh, a, a difficult question for me, <laughs> and now a short answer. <laughs> Um, no, I think the most important, uh, uh, the most important uh, guide I can give is, is to know uh, what the mix of your drivers is. And, and indeed, as mentioned, if you have enough capacity available and you're willing to do the investment to install the charging infrastructure at, your, at the office, um, then, then the, the price at the office in most cases, especially if we're talking bigger offices, will always be uh, will always be cheaper. What we do notice is that uh, that capacity could be an issue in the future. So before all of you go out and, and, and install a lot of chargers and tell people that they don't, are not allowed to charge at home, um, it, it might be good, it, it is always good to analyze your fleet because it might be that those people who have the opportunity to charge at home, that you need them to do it there, even if it is a little bit more expensive, to protect your infrastructure and your grid and electricity capacity at the office. Is there an easy, quick answer that you're asking? No, talk to your partners, do the analysis. It will differ within every company from office to, uh, to office. Okay, a uh, question for Martin. Martin, there were a few questions related to telematics and technology. Do you recommend, based on the experience that you have also with the customers that you have, do you recommend that telematics is needed to well monitor the electric fleet efficiency and also the right use of the vehicles, or can you do without? Well, I can only say that it will certainly help you to, uh, to manage your fleet more efficiently. Um, I can certainly support that uh, angle. However, what we also see uh, in various countries that worker councils, for instance, is also a uh, important topic to overcome. So that's a little bit of a mix. Yes, uh, it, it will help you to uh, to manage your fleet more efficiently, especially the usage of uh, plug-in hybrids, uh, for instance, charging them. Um, but worker councils are a complicating factor in that. Uh, what we see in uh, in the market, at least with my customers. Okay, uh, Tor, final question for you related to page, uh, PHEV. Um, I think in the uh, answers from both Martin and Peter, uh, it was clear that uh, if you have a driver with a PHEV, you of course want him or her to drive it correctly. And not only, let's say, on the ICE engine. Um, can you give some kind of tip for the fleet managers in the room in how they can, let's say, include in their car policy and their strategy towards those PHEV drivers, uh, one or the other uh, element to make sure, to ensure that they drive their PHEV in the correct way and that they charge it also on a regular basis. Yeah. Um, including it in the revised Car policy is one thing. Uh, you can include a certain percentage that you are expected to um, run on electricity instead of the ICE uh, engine. But then it is uh, it, 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 it quite easily is our experience. It easily slips away and the attention is gone. What is what is really important is that it is a frequent topic of discussion. So. When uh, sitting together with your sales team or when you have your one-to-ones, um, um, the manager uh, of the driver should address this topic and actively discuss this. And not necessarily to um, incentivize or to penalize uh, the behavior, but at least to demonstrate to the driver that there is a constant monitoring on this cost element and that it saves the companies a significant amount of money. And we will support that. We will support that with analysis and with comparisons. And we can, we can even include if that driver population is open to that, we can offer programs where it, it is more sort of a, a competition is created with the drivers and it stimulates them to sh to score high on the on the ladder. Nobody wants to, sh to 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 end up in the last, especially when that list is uh, is communicated in a gentle way. 
Of course, we have to be careful uh, around uh, privacy and data uh, sharing on that topic, but we have plenty a suite of uh, measures in order to stimulate that. It's not only a matter of putting it in the car policy, a lot more comes to it because we are fully aware how important this element is. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much. As mentioned by Toch Konings of Athlon International, uh, they will and we will, together with Athlon, answer the questions that you had for the experts. Thank you very much, Peter Golsens, Maarten Weyenberg, and Toch Konings, and of course, Athlon International for supporting this virtual Fleet Week webinar. This webinar will be also recorded so you can relive the webinar afterwards also on the website and we will of course continue the virtual fleet week because the week is not over yet so as mentioned by uh, by martin i think tomorrow we have the webinar about efficient charging on when on thursday on 15 october we will deep dive into fleet security and efficiency standards and finally, there is fleet electrification and how to implement EVs in your fleet. So uh, it's very important that you are well updated about the possibilities of electrification. And so we hope, of course, that you can also join our future webinars this week. You can register for free on our website, fleeteurope.com. Once again, I would like to thank Athlon for their support and we hope that you have an electrified future. Thank you, and bye-bye. Bye-bye, thank you. Bye-bye, gentlemen. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.